I want to be cognizant of the time because I know it's a long gospel and there's a short version. But there's so much depth in the reading. It can touch so many people so many different ways. Think of a time when someone has accompanied you, has accompanied you in perhaps after a bad, a difficult medical diagnosis and treatment. Or think about some time when you, someone has accompanied you as you've had to go through pain and grief and loss. It is a great grace that God gives us through the, that act of accompaniment. And it's reciprocal. It, it graces the person who walks with us. Every year during Lent, we journey with Jesus. He's on his way to Jerusalem, to what he knows is his, his betrayal, his passion, and his death, and his resurrection. The last three Sundays have been special because we have been accompanying our brothers and sisters who are discerning and yearning by this point, I think, who have the desire to come into the church at the Easter Vigil. These were the catechumen, um, and now we call them the elect because we have seen in them what is all on all of us to be the elect of God, chosen for eternal life. And we journey with them. We support them by our prayers and by our, just by being with them. The, there are three, these last, this Sunday and the two previous Sundays have been a liturgical rite called the scrutinies where they all come up and we, we don't scrutinize them. It's sort of a misnomer, it must be a Latin word. It's not like we go, Father Edwin comes to the first person and says, have you ever sped in a school zone? <laughs> have you ever fibbed on your taxes? It's not that kind of scrutiny. It's, it's an internal, we're calling them to an internal examination of their conscience, of what they want, of asking them to deepen their desire with God's help to know more about him and to be more fully conformed through the sacraments and through the rest of their life to his cross and resurrection. And when we do this, we do this, the third scrutiny today is at the 2 p.m. and the 4.30 mass. Um, and all of the elects should be there for those, those rituals. When we do that, we read the same three gospels every year. Two weeks ago, remember, it was the Samaritan woman at the well. Last week, it was the man, the healing of the man born blind. And of course, this week, it's the resurrection, the raising of Lazarus. There are, to me, there are three, across these three, the first one is not technically a miracle or a sign, it's just, something that falls in with the scrutinies that we're asking the elect to consider. And we, these have been in the Sabbath guide for the last two weeks and then today. And like Father Edwin, I encourage you to take that home. And part of accompaniment, part of accompanying our elect is to do this with them. Not to say, you know, God straighten these people out. May God straighten me out. Two weeks ago, the Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus is traveling through Samaria, where a Jew would not want to go, on his way to Jerusalem, and his apostles, the disciples, go into town to buy food. He waits at the well. He's tired and thirsty. And a woman comes in the heat of the day to get water for herself and her family. She's probably an outcast. And we, as we learn her story, we understand why she comes at a time when no one else will be at the well. And Jesus says, give me a drink. He doesn't ask for a drink. He says, give me a drink. And in his humanity, he is thirsty. But as the son of God, he is reaching out to her for relationship. For the relationship that he knows can bring her to eternal life. That he will give her living water. And it's the same word as running water. 
And so that's what she originally thinks of. That would be great. Indoor plumbing, Lord. If we could have water at the house. Living water welling up for eternal life. And they dialogue. He doesn't condemn her. He acknowledges her sin, but he doesn't condemn. Give me a drink. Jesus wants that relationship with each one of us, with us as a community of faith and with each one of us. And he comes to us and he says, give me a drink. Last Sunday is one of my favorite stories in the gospel, the man born blind. It starts out as a theological discussion that that the disciples pose on Jesus. Who sinned? Where's the sin? Show us the sin. He said, no one sinned. This man was born like this so that the glory of God could be displayed in him. And the direct commandment he gives, the command, he gives this person. He scoops up dust, dirt, he spits in his hand. He makes a paste and he rubs this paste on the man's eyes. He doesn't ask. In so many of the miracles, people come to Jesus and they say, he says, what do you want me to do for you? He wants them to say it. Not this time. He rubs the paste on his eyes and says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And he does that. And he raises his head and for the first time in his life, he can see. He can see the light. And before the story ends, he can see the light of the world. Jesus wants to give us that light. He wants us to move into the light. Sadly, the religious authorities of the time were so scared of Jesus and so envious that they cast this man out of the synagogue. They effectively excommunicate him from the community. They move further into darkness, even as this man born blind moves into the light. Jesus wants each of us to come into the light, to be closer to him. And today, the greatest of the signs in John's gospel, a man who has been dead for four days with no embalming, the Orthodox Jews still today bury within 24 hours because they believe it's wrong to embalm the body. So you have to do something immediately. Four days in the dark, in the tomb. And Martha comes to Jesus and says, If you had been here, if you had just been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, she's almost afraid to ask. I know that God will give you whatever you want. And he says, your brother will rise. And she says, I know, I know, he'll rise on the resurrection at the last day, pie in the sky in the sweet by and by. And he says, Martha, The resurrection isn't something that's out there, not yet. The resurrection is standing here talking to you. I am the resurrection. I came that everyone could have life and have it abundantly and eternally. And he calls a dead man out of his grave. And the most direct way to think about this, I guess, is the direct command here is Lazarus come out. But I would, ask you, I would ask you to think this morning, that's astounding and supernatural, but the story turns on another command. Jesus says, take away the stone. Now, John's gospel, the four gospels are written from different perspectives. It's like you've heard the example, the four people see a traffic accident. One person's on the corner, one's in another car, one's in a building, one's on a, watching from a camera, and they see the same thing from different perspectives. There's no conflict. John's gospel has a very, has a higher Christology. He, he sees, he's, it's probably written after the other three, and he sees through divine revelation the divinity of Christ profoundly. Jesus didn't have to ask for help to move the stone. Jesus didn't have to ask when he got to town, where have you put him? Jesus didn't have to ask at the end of the story, untie him. He could have done all those things. This is the man, the God man, 
who was on a ship, on a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And his, his friends are terrified and he says, he's sleeping through the storm, they're about to sink. And they say, wake up. And he stands up and said, peace, be still. And the sea is flat as glass. He could have moved the stone as a divine command. But he willed that the friends and family of Lazarus participate. The physical stone that sealed the tomb of Lazarus represents for me the things that block me from knowing the grace and the mercy of God. The regret, the shame, the grudges that I've held have kept me from knowing the forgiveness and peace and grace of God so many times. And God says, Jesus says, take away the stone. The stone from Lazarus is, now Lazarus was, pow well, powerless. And sometimes we're, we need help, like I talked about the grace of accompaniment. We need help there. We have brokenness in our life that we can be helped with counseling, good Christian counselors with friends who will journey with us. And above all in the sacraments, in the sacrament of reconciliation, God can begin to heal those broken places. But he wills that we don't, he does not do it against our will. He wills our cooperation, which is one of the thousand things that I wouldn't do if I was God. He wills us to want to be with him. And sometimes all we have to do is take away the stone. <laughs>